Well, hello again, we're back and just to, uh, explaining a little bit more about the Portuguese and what they're trying to do. I think one of the big ideas here is that the Portuguese are trying to outdo the Italians again. The Italians have just sort of this virtual monopoly on trade. And so the Portuguese are like, yeah, we got to get some of that. <laughs> so that's why they're kind of interested in finding this different sea route to Asia, mapping everything in sight, going around Africa all the way to India and so on and so forth. There's just another, uh, just a really good map. Again, with all these PowerPoints, I, I will put the PowerPoints online here so you can check them out and uh, go at your own speed through them if you'd like to. But there's just a lot of cool things to notice here. You can see when everything is happening. There's already established um, trade routes here that go pretty much right through Italy and right through Constantinople here but basically Venice is like the number one place port where you can go but the Portuguese are just on their heels looking for different goods and services what are they looking for in Africa too on the way as they start to explore golden slaves, slavery Keep that in mind for later. So Christopher Columbus uh, enters onto the scene. Now, so Portugal is looking at things. Spain is now looking at, at exploring. And one of the things Spain is looking at is, how are we going to get in on this action? So you've got Queen Isabella here and King Ferdinand. And basically click on all this stuff here so you can see it but Christopher Columbus is kind of looking to make his mark as an explorer too and here he is he's an Italian from Genoa his parents are basically weavers he's been cloth, cloth, cloth for a living and he's just a guy that's kind of a visionary in, in a lot of ways one of his ideas is that the world is indeed round um, of course he has no way to prove his theory but what he wants to do is he's looking to explore and Queen, Isabe uh, Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand are looking for someone to explore and to, and what he does is he goes to them and he says hey look I know you're trying to get in on the action of trying to find a trade route to Asia so I'm your man he goes there he secures this royal backing from them to basically fund an expedition so they find a better trade route to the to the East Indies and, and Asia and so forth. Of course Christopher Columbus, lots of controversy with him because of just the things that have happened as a result of Christopher Columbus exploring. <laughs> so, such as Columbus Day uh, for example. But, but anywho he gets the royal backing. It's a high risk, high return uh, type of idea for Ferdinand and Isabella here, as they're like, okay, if if Columbus finds something that is awesome, if he finds another way to get in on this action for the trade route to Asia, that's great. If not, eh, we got money. We're the king and the queen for crying out loud. So, what did Columbus explore and discover in the Western Atlantic? Well, quite a bit. He discovered an island that's 300 miles north of Cuba, which was renamed Hispaniola. Now, when he got there in 1492, he thought that they were in the East Indies, which is like, if I go back to the other map... Sorry. Thought he was right here. This would be the Dutch East Indies later, but as you, as you can see. So he thinks he's there. Of course, he's not there. And of course, what's the first thing he sees when he gets off the boat? I'll come back to that in a little bit later. He discovers that there are natives which of course Columbus is going to call Indians these are what are called the Tainos now Columbus very famously writes there's another picture kind of glorifying 
Yes, I got that from Wikipedia. Columbus is kind of glorifying, glorifying Columbus here, you know, landfall is there, you know, claiming this for the king and the queen of Spain and all this stuff. But one of the things that is very interesting about all of this, one of the things that's interesting about all of this is basically that you have this glorification here of Columbus in these photographs, or I'm sorry, not photographs, but paintings. And uh, to be honest with you, nothing can be further from the truth. When he got off the ship, and I'll talk about these slides in a little bit. When he got off the ship, he sees these Native Americans and he says, oh, awesome, cool. And he says in his diaries explicitly, like, these are some great slaves that I can bring back to the king and queen. Uh, with no trouble, we will have to, to not only Christianize them, but subjugate them. They're going to be great. And they're uncivilized. They don't wear any clothes. Oh, right. And so the, nati the, the perception of Native Americans in stereotyping really starts there, which is, of course, the big controversy about Columbus. You know, in, in elementary school, little kids are taught, hey, sail the ocean blue, 1492. Nina Pinta the Santa Maria. It doesn't talk about all this stuff that's going to happen. The big impact of Columbus is called the Geographic Revolution and the Columbian Exchange. The big thing, first of all, is that the European understanding of world geography changes from just being like this flat world eventually to this idea that there's a world on the other side of the Atlantic and then eventually Later, years later, European explorers, for again, Magellan specifically, is going to circumnavigate the world and discover that the world is indeed round. Increased European exploration. No doubt this leads to tremendous investment by monarchs. For example, King Henry VII sending John Cabot to find a Northwest Passage as five years later. It seems like everybody now sees that there is a new world. People want a, to find trade routes. They want advantages. And exploring is the way to go. Whereas Columbus might be looking for a passage to Asia. In England, they're looking for a Northwest passage, which can be interpreted as trying to go north um, and trying to go basically where Canada is all the way around the world so in order to get to Asia. Perhaps the most important thing to understand about the, the legacy of Columbus is this whole idea called the Columbian Exchange. And this is where Europeans bring their diseases, their plants, their animals, horses especially, and Christ and Christianity to the New World, whereas the New World in exchange brings their goods, corn, tobacco, potatoes, stuff like that, as well as other things like syphilis. So there's a back and forth here when cultures can connect and collide. And there's going to be a ton of European exploration in the next century, Again, feel free to take a look at this as you guys go back and study. But everybody wants a piece of the action to go figure out what's up in this new world. One of the things, too, that you see right here that I need to probably mention is this line called the Treaty of Tordesillas line in 1494. This is the line whereby Spain and Portugal will divide everything that's west is going to be of this line belongs to the purview of the Spanish everything to the east belongs to Portugal henceforth that's why Brazil is a Portuguese speaking nation and pretty much everything else in South America and Central America is Spanish speaking there's another picture of the Colombian exchange again take a look at this if you can a little bit later but you can see the different things goods services whatever it is that's brought back and then brought back and then 
all of this is going on constantly, 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 constantly. One thing that's interesting to note about this is if you look at livestock, there is no cows, pigs, anything like that, horses in this area of the world. You know what they have down here? Llamas. Seriously. <laughs> they don't have farm animals like uh, we know farm animals. Spaniards uh, explored, conquered, and colonized New Spain. We already talked a little bit about Hernando Cortez and how he defeated the Mexica Empire with tremendous military technology using horses for increased mobility, troops and manpower, um, victory uh, versus total surrender adhered to by the Mexica, and of course disease 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 when you look at the history of this area again I can't emphasize it enough disease more than anything else kills Native American tribes and just being smart about mobilizing the help of enemies of the Emperor Montezuma or Moctezuma depending on how you want to call it so, so Spaniards are very good at conquering very good at at using primitive shock and awe you know like you know, fronting like they're gods and scaring the living heck out of <laughs> out of the uh, natives and this is a picture of, of that here too Pizarro is another conquistador and the numbers are staggering he conquers nine million of an empire called the Incas in 1532 with 200 men. <clears throat> However, there was an unsuccessful colonial attempt uh, uh, in Florida where Hernan de Soto tries to take over that area and fails miserably. So the Spanish, I guess, were two out of three when you think about this. Great video, Guns, Germs, and Steel. If I can use that for you to see I will try to upload that as well as a result of not being able to really gain a good foothold in Florida Spain is going to concentrate primarily on colonizing Mexico and Peru and what they're going to do is this policy of mercantilism now mercantilism basically means just I'm sorry controlling all the um, the trade of all goods and services coming out of of these countries so for example if, if Pizarro controls all of Peru or subsequent administrations are going to control everything that the Incas did what they're going to do is they're going to mine this they're going to take everything out of the country send it back to Spain so that the Spanish crown can use that to buy weapons and stuff to carry on their wars in Europe. That's what mercantilism is. It's just basically a policy where you try to, to dig up all possible resources, mine all possible resources, sell all possible resources in order so that the mother country gets rich. New Spain in the 16th century, Spain became the dominant power in the Western Hemisphere. In New Spain, you have a distinctive co uh, colonial society where you have uh, a system whereby natives are subjugated. It's called the encomienda system. I encourage you to meet, read more about that. Wealth was created but uh, by silver and gold mining primarily. Socially and racially, um, you have a, a series of one to two percent Europeans and ninety-eight percent of other that are mestizos or of mixed race, and that is what you pretty much have society-wise and culturally-wise in what it was called New Spain. So, in the next lecture, we'll finish out uh, chapter two.